Okay, we're beginning a new series today called Flourish, and basically what it's all about is the very reason why you and I are alive and why Cornerstone is the church it is, in fact, every church for that matter. What we're going to be looking at in the next several weeks is why are we here? We believe our purposes are is to know God, to find the freedom He's promised us, discover the purpose while we're alive, and then make a difference. And that's basically the Great Commission for those of you that are, are more are familiar with that. We'll get into later times. That God has called us to flourish. He's not called us just to survive. He's called us to flourish. The reason why you're alive is for a reason. We believe that every person is important. Every person has a destiny and a purpose. And so what can happen is you and I can get distracted by many things and lose out on what God's called us to do. And so as a Cornerstone Church, our primary purpose is to know God. So we're going to be going through that in the next uh, several weeks. And I want to encourage you that to realize that all of us are called for greatness. God has not called us just to survive. God has called us to thrive. I really believe that. Now, this is not a um, get rich type of sermon. This is not about a happiness now. No, what this is basically about is this. God has designed us for a purpose, and everyone has a purpose to have a fulfilling life in Christ. That's why God has made us. The desire to obtain success, the, the, the desire to be successful, to be comfortable, the desire to discover new things, those are all God-given desires that he's placed in our hearts. The problem is when mankind puts those affections in the wrong way, they end up hurting themselves and other people. But the desire to be successful, the desire to be happy, all of that is God-given, but it's misdirected. And so when we get ourselves directed in the proper sequence, what God has called us, we do truly find ultimate happiness. That's beyond the span of this life. That's beyond circumstances. That's unmovable and unshakable. How many folks would like to have that kind of solidarity during difficult times on the planet? I don't know if you've noticed. Have you watched the news and what happened to Mali? We know different places like that. The terrorist attacks that are taking place, the economy, which is very much uh, fragile. If you notice how things are and how the world economic system is very fragile, we can see what's going on in the Middle East. We talked about that several weeks ago. If you want to go to cornerstonecheshire.com, we talk a little bit about the end times. And I do believe that we are in the end of the end times. I don't know how it's all going to play out, but I do need to know I do need to know, and so do you, how to live during these times. And the Bible talks about it right here in Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, um, 15. The Bible says the following. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore... Do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is, which we're going to get into in the coming weeks. But the part I want to bring to your attention is making the most of every opportunity called redeeming the time. Now, how do you redeem the time? When I was growing up, my dad tried to redeem the time by driving. I'm going to make up time. We had a, we had a 1975 Grand Torino um, station wagon. It really got hot, and we'd be, we had to try to make up time, you know, by flooring the, going fast in the car. He got pulled over. Dad, I'm sorry. But anyhow, that's where I got my, uh, that's the genetic thing I need to get rid of, uh, the desire to speed. But anyhow, but, you know, redeeming the time or trying to make up a lost time. Well, you know, God has called us to redeem the time, and, and the word time, by the way, used in the Greek here, in the Greek language, is basically two types of words for time. One is chronos, Chronos would be like your watch, okay? It's chronology. Why Kairos is an opportune time for, for movement of purpose. An opportune time for movement of purpose on the perfect opportunity. Kairos moments, the Bible says, in the fullness of time Christ came. In the fullness of God's Kairos. So it's a season of, of, of grace more than it is a literal time, like 4.30 in the afternoon, okay? And so what God has called us for is he's called us, it says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. In other words, be ready for what's taking place. So how do you read this? I, I want to just uh, maybe read it a little backward to help us to understand the difference between that. And let's just say it's, it's talking about this. Um, 
you know, I don't know if I, you realize it, but let's just read this backwards for a second. You put that scripture back up there. Redeeming the time of the days are evil because the days are evil. Because we're living in evil days, and we are. Because we're living in evil days, God is going to give the church favorable moments. God, because the days are evil, God's going to give kairos, God's timing, to the church that you could be wise to live in these times because we're living in end times. So the issue is we are in the end times, and God is going to give us times to redeem the time. You know, Sandra just shared, and again, this is when we share these things, we share them because we want to encourage you that we can do this at home. I used to watch television when I was growing up. There's a thing they'll call, that's incredible. I'm really dating myself now. And said, do not try this at home. We want to say, try this at home. Try this at the workplace. God wants to redeem time wherever you are put because we're living in these days. And so part of the redeeming is God moments, that God might give me a moment at work. God might give me a moment at the, at the grocery store. God might give you a moment with your neighbor when you're blow, he's blowing his leaves or her leaves on your yard, and you want to, okay. Am I the only person that this happens to? Why do they blow all the leaves in my yard? And then it was so funny. I was like, man, this is getting frustrating. My whole, and then God sent an east wind, and it blew all the leaves off my yard into my neighbor's. <laughs> then into his mind, say the Lord, I will blow the leaves. No, that's not what it said. I, <laughs> I'm just joking, everybody. But the, the issue is this. God gives us kairos moments to make a difference, and we're not here just to consume. We're here to give. We're here to be a blessing. And that's all part of it. So really, because the days are evil, God is going to give the church favorable moments. I believe God's going to give Cornerstone Church favorable moments in your school districts, in your workplaces, in the local government, in your workplace, in your play groups. God will give you favorable moments. He'll give you Kairos times where you can help people become to know God. Let me tell you, it's a lot more exciting to live for God than to live for yourself. We'll get into that in a few moments. And so I read that, and people are saying, what's going on in the world today? What, what's going on, and what are we supposed to do? And I don't know about you, but I, I read the paper. I, who, who reads the paper? I read the Internet, and I see the stuff going on. It can be overwhelming, can't it? When I read about genetic engineering, when I read about all these things that are taking place and the things that mankind can do, uh, it, it's, it's astounding what can happen in the wrong hands, the technology and the grace that God has given us through science. And so we see more of this happening. And so more and more we need God's kairos times. And I like what the Bible says. From Matthew eleven twelve. this is what it says. And from the time of John the Baptist began preaching until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing, and violent people are attacking it. Uh, that's a different translation just to kind of explain to you what's happening. But the kingdom of God is advancing, and God's kingdom does not advance timidly. It advances powerfully. God wants us to be a people that plow forward strongly in his grace. And the kingdom of God suffers violent, and the violent take it by force. We're not discussing here about violence. What it's talking about is bringing forth God's grace, God's way. You see, many of us have the idea that we have to hold on till he comes back. But God has not called us to hold on. He's called us to advance. Listen, if you're, if you're into sports, which we like to watch and, and participate in, and football, for example, have you noticed what they try to do in football? What do you try to do? Go across the lines, right, to go to the end goal. I, I forgot the name of it now. I'm such a good football fan. But anyhow, you want to get a touchdown, don't you? You want to score. But if your objective is to stop people from scoring, and that's all you want to do, what, you're never going to win. You're going to be constantly frustrated, and your teammates are going to be frustrated. God has not called us just to protect the line. He's called us to march forward. When you march forward, that's your protection. When you and I are doing God's will, that's our protection. And I've had people say to me, we had a missionary we supported in Israel, and people said, well, why are you going to Israel? Isn't that dangerous? And the person said, you know, the safest place I can be is in the middle of God's hand. If he's calling me to go to the middle of Afghanistan, if that's where he's calling me, there's no safer place to be than the middle of God's will. 
And so we believe that God has called us to advance, not retreat. That you and I should make impact upon culture. Now, I'm not suggesting for a moment that we're going to bring back the kingdom of heaven. I'm not that kind of philosophy or end-time theology. But God never said stay. He said go. It's an action. Go to all the earth. Make a difference. My friends, we are called to make a difference for Christ. Well, how do we do that? We do that by joining his team, by joining his understanding. We have to leave the mentality of a defense mechanism. I can't believe this is happening in our country. They're taking our schools. They're taking our government. And we sit there like this the whole time, and we're getting back. I can't believe this is happening. It's not about that. It's about advancing forward, advancing the purposes of Christ and making a difference in showing love and showing strength and getting involved with the process of life, making a difference wherever you're put. This is what God has called the church to be, not just to be a place where we hope he comes back soon because things are getting rough. That's not the way. I don't know about you, but I much more prefer to attack than retreat. And we attack by love. Now, I know that sounds like an oxymoron. How do you attack by love? Because the strongest force that you and I can do through the power of God is showing love. It is a battering ram that nothing can stop. The early church, greatest power is when it loved well. The battering ram of Stephen when he was martyred, it broke through. My friends, the people that are suffering for their faith right now in Iran that are imprisoned, that battering through through the love of Christ. I don't even begin to understand what it's like. Because we don't live in those type of environment here today. But we're not called just to defend. We're called to move forward, to make a difference, to bring the love of God wherever he placed us. And that's our job. And, and really the job of, my, of being a pastor here is to help make those steps clear for all of us to run on. We're not called just to come and make it through the day and I uh, hope I get something this week just to get encouraged me enough to move on. No, I understand there might be times, like, for example, physically, I've been sick for the last couple of weeks. Sometimes you just got to relax and get better. But we're not called to do that forever. We're called, to, yes, to, to get better, but we're called to move forward. And God has you where you are for a reason. What, where you are right now is where God has you right now. And do your best where he's placed you. Make a difference in the school system. Make a difference at the, at the shop. Make a difference in the neighborhood playgroup. Wherever God has you, make a difference where you are by being Christ by being a person that is attacking darkness, how do you attack darkness? By putting on the light. It's not about mustering up the strength. It's about letting God fly and flow through us. So we'll be talking about that. God's called us to flourish. And how do we know how to flourish? We have to know God. Our, God, our job is to get people to help ourselves to know God. It is a never-ending process process. We'll get into in a few moments. Help people find freedom. Many people have been Christians for many, many years, but there's stuff that holds them back. Mindsets, addictions, all sorts of stuff. Well, Jesus died on the cross. I'm free. Really? If you're still free, you have to access the power of the cross in the different areas of your life to become freer. I mean, I pray that to next year at this time, I'll be more free than I am this year. And so finding freedom is a lifelong process uh, given to you by God. Another one is, is discovering the purpose. When you begin to find freedom, instead of battling addictions and battling issues and battling relationship problems where all you have to do is argue with your spouse or argue with your parents or have always conflict and turmoil, when you get rid of that kind of stuff, all of a sudden you start knowing the reason why you're alive and a passion begins to be birthed inside of you. Where, wow, this is what I'm created to do. And that passion helps you to make a difference that God has given you to do. And our job as a church is to help you to know God, to find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference for Christ. That's the Great Commission in a nutshell. We're going to be breaking it apart a little further. But today, real simple is this. Today we're going to look at how to know God. How do you know God? Now, you're probably saying that's pretty obvious. I don't think it's, just, it's, it's very obvious. But at the same time, it's very elusive to many people. God wants us to know him. It's amazing. I was reading statistics and you know, statistics are funny. You can read all kinds of statistics. But pre, uh, Pew Research says 94% of Americans believe in God. 80-some-odd percent believe in Jesus Christ. Like, how can that? Then you ask him more questions, it changes. But there is a sense 
that there is a God. In most cultures you go today, you'll see that. Why? Because you're created in God's image, right? Remember, I, I'll say this all the time. You're created by God for God. Until you give your life to God, you hurt yourself on other people because you're designed by God. But people believe in God. And I, I think there's three types of people that believe in God. The first one is this. Some, some people say, I believe in God, but I don't know him. I believe in God, but I don't know him. And that would be like a deist, a person that believes there's a God, but he's someplace far off. And what we want to do is try to be a good person, try to be better than our neighbors, and try to help the poor, and, you know, be nice, and once in a while throw a coin in the Salvation Army thing. Makes you feel good when you go to the store. You know, be nice and do something well. And, and maybe God, I'll be okay. You know, God's over there, and, uh, you know, that's my job. No, that's not your job, and that's not what we're called to do. I say, I believe in God is not enough. Do you realize the Bible says even the demons shudder and fear, it says in the book of James, you say you believe in God, big deal. So do the demons. It's not enough to believe in God, my friends. God doesn't want us just to believe in him. He wants us to know him. And maybe today you believe there's a God, but you're not quite sure about it. Listen, I completely respect, and so does God, the process of you trying to find God. If you're, if you're searching today, we, that's okay. We're okay with it. Really, we are. We realize that coming to know Christ can be a process, and I understand that. But I also understand sometimes we deny Christ because we want to do our own thing. There's a difference between that. But a lot of people say they believe in God, but they don't know God. You know, the Bible says in, in, in 1 John 2, 3 through 4, now by this... We know that we know him. How do we know that we know him? If we keep his commandments, he who says, I know him, does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Now, when you read that, you're like, oh, no, here we go. You're going to get a big, big book out. You're going to point your finger at me and say, everything I'm doing is wrong. No, let me make something very, very clear. You can't save yourself. I don't care if you're, you do everything right. You follow everything right in the Bible. If you've not surrendered your life to Christ, it's not good enough. You see, Jesus Christ paid the price for our sins on the cross. That's what makes us right with God, not our behavior. However, if you've given your life to Christ, there should be, a, um, there should be evidence of a new life that's, that's growing. And so when we say these things, if, if you say you're a lemon tree and you're producing apples, there's a problem. If I say I'm an apple tree and I'm giving out pears, it's, I mean, there's nothing wrong with pears per se, but if I say I'm an apple tree and I'm giving out pears, no, I'm not an apple tree. And so the Bible's saying if you love him, you will obey his commandments. And so if you don't, you've got to ask yourself the question, who's really running your life? Now, I, I can't judge the state where you are, but it's a question the Bible asks us. It's a very sobering question. You know, the Bible says something very sobering, too, and I know this will kind of rattle some of your cages, but it says in Matthew 7, Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter it. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, I passed a church in Cheshire. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm adding that down there. We built a children's wing. We prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name. Listen, you can do a lot of stuff with God. You can use his name. You can, you can fool a lot of people. But the Bible says this. We prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name. But I will rep reply, I never knew you. Get away from me who break God's laws. That's sobering, is it not? Yeah, it is. Just because you're doing this stuff, it is a surrendered heart and will to God. And this is why it's very difficult for me and even you to ascertain the sta status of your life. We can see evidence for it. But the Bible makes sure that how do you know you know God? How do you know you will know God? Well, a life that is surrendered to God, when you get, give her the keys to your life and say, my life is not my own anymore, I give it to you, God. That's all part of it. So there's some people that know, believe in God, but they don't know him. There's people that believe in God and don't know him. And then there's other people that you know him, 
but you don't know him well. You, you know God, and you come to church, and you believe in him. You've given your life to him. You've prayed the prayer. You've, you've gone to the Bible studies. You've gone to the small groups. You did all these various things. You, you know him, but you don't know him that well. Uh, when I grew up in the 19, um, 1870s, uh, I used to like to watch the Yankees. I still, you know, I used to have a little more free time on my hand. And I used to watch something. I grew up in Long Island, New York. There's something called WPIX, which used to broadcast every single Yankee game before the Yes Network came and had to charge you with this money on cable, which we don't watch anymore because of that. So if you want to donate to the Yes Fund, you're more than welcome to. <coughs> but anyhow, so I grew up watching the Yankees in the heyday, uh, at least I thought of Craig Nettles and Ron Guidry and all those great Thurman Munson. And there was this broadcaster by the name of Phil Rizzuto, who I absolutely felt was we, our whole family Love Phil Rizzuto. He was, a, he was a Yankee in the 1950s. He was an MVP in 1950. He was the guy who was a great shortstop. He could steal bases. He could bunt like no one's business. He played small ball. He was a funny and great guy. But he became no, no, more notorious in his broadcasting career than his baseball career. And so I used to watch these Yankee games. And let me tell you, sometimes they're boring. But he would make it fun. Him and Bill White would be there on talking about, you know, he'd be sick in there, and there'd be a double to talking about his heartburn from an Italian restaurant in mid-Manhattan, and he'd be laughing about stuff. The guy was amazing, and I, and I feel like I knew him. Never forget when Thurman Munson died in a plane crash. Phil Rosito was crying on the air, and my whole family, my, my father and me, we were all weeping along with the fact that Thurman Munson died, and it was Phil Rosito. He's a part of our life. He really was. I felt like he was part of my growing up time. Well, in, the, in, in 2000, I was in Times Square and uh, around New Year's time. Not New Year's Day. I would never go then. And guess who I ran into in Times Square? Phil Rizzuto. That's right. So I saw Phil Rizzuto. I said, Mr. Rizzuto, it's an honor to know you, sir. I, I've watched you. I feel like I knew him already. I've watched you for nearly 15 years. And since I was a 7-year-old and now I'm... Uh, I think at the time, I, you know, I watched him all the way till I was in college. And here he is. I met him. He says, well, that's good to meet you, too. He invited me to his house. I met his wife. He made me some uh, macaroni and cheese. And we, he gave me an autographed ball. No, that didn't happen. That didn't happen. That didn't, <laughs> that didn't happen. However, <laughs> I did meet him and shake his hand, which was an honor. But I knew, I know Phil Rizzuto, but I didn't know him well. And many of you know about Jesus. Maybe you've shaked his hand. Maybe you come to church. You, you read about him, but you really don't know him. And, and some of you think, I'm not good enough to know him. And I have good news for you. Either am I. None of us are good enough to know him. But Jesus loves us so much that he makes us good because of what he's done on the cross by paying the price of our sins. And so some of you feel like you can never... Be anything great in the kingdom of God except for a doorkeeper or whatever God's. I don't think I could ever be quite on the upper echelon. I'm going to live on the bad, wrong side of the tracks in the kingdom of heaven because of what I've done. My friends, I have news for you. The blood of Jesus Christ is enough to wash you of every single sin that you don't have to be ashamed, but you can boldly enter into the presence of God by not what you've done, but what you've surrendered and what you let Christ do in you. This is all part of the process that God would have for you. You see, this is what happened. God became a man for this purpose. I'm, I'm quoting St. Augustine here. Since, since he was a human being, since, God, since you're a human being, could not reach God, but you can reach other humans, can't you? You can't reach God, but you can reach other humans. You might now... You might now reach God through a man. And so the man Christ Jesus became a mediator of God in human beings. God became a man so that by following a man, something you are able to do, you might reach God. Which was formerly impossible to you. That is a, that's a translation from, the, from, the, from the, his writing. But basically, he's saying, you see, I can't follow God because I'm not God, but I can follow a man. And that's why God became a man, that we could follow him. Which brings us to the basic point we want to bring to you today is this. Jesus is calling us. He never said, come believe in me. What did he say? Come what? 
Come follow. Follow me and I will make you. Yeah, fishers of men, whatever you want to call it. He will make you by following him. You see, this is the beautiful part of it. We're not called to reinvent the wheel. We're called to follow him. And that Jesus will show us the path if we follow him. Now, very interesting, many of us know about Christ, but we don't know him well, and Christ wants us to know. Well, how can we know God more? How do we get to know God more? You know, what's so amazing is this, and some of you might think, well, it's kind of boring. I mean, church is boring. God's boring. What I find so amazing is this. My parents have been married 56 years, okay, and, and this is what they tell me. They say, we're finding out stuff about each other even now. I'm learning more about your mom. I didn't realize how beautiful she was. She's more beautiful to me now than she was when I first met her. And, and I hear that. And they have a deeper love because they keep discovering more about each other. Now, that's a human relationship. Do you realize that discovering God should be and can be the most adventurous thing that you do? Listen, it's like being on vacation and going to the Grand Canyon, which I had the privilege of going to, and hiking to the bottom, hiking back up to the top, looking over the expanse. It's like going to Yosemite. It's like going to Hawaii. It's like going to the Fiji Islands or wherever and seeing this great, gorgeous, um, um, beautiful creation. Or how about the foliage we just experienced before all the leaves fell off the trees? How beautiful it was, right? It's an adventure. You look up in the sky on a clear night. You're like, what are all those stars? And it overtakes you. That's, that's the glory of God. That's God's creation. It is a shadow of who he is. It's not him. And so the pursuits of sports, the pursuits of entertainment, all of that is a shadow of God. We're talking about the creator of all these things. My friends, you can never exhaust knowing God. It's like being on a permanent vacation of sightseeing of extraordinary sights. If you're bored, it's not God's fault. If you go to the Grand Canyon, you stay in your hotel room, have the shades drawn, playing Crush Candy Crush. If one more person invites me to play that silly game, I tell you, I'm going to unfriend you. What's this Candy Crush thing? I don't understand it. Come to Farmville. What well, you guys? Whatever. But if you're sitting there in the hotel room and you got the, I mean, you're missing out. My friends, there's so much more of God in us. We want to know him. He has good things for us not to be bored, but there is an adventure for us. You see, the reason why so many, so many of us get involved with various things, like taking drugs, some people do, to feel excitement, to get drunk, to have excitement, or get involved with video games where you're playing uh, black water, whatever you're playing, and you're sitting there and you're spending all your day to find adventure playing a video game because you're created for adventure, you're created for purpose, but you're chewing gum with your life. It has the, uh, ha looks like you're eating, but you're not eating anything. God has something better for us. There's nothing wrong with entertainment if it entertains and revitalizes you. But when golf, when kids' sports become the main thing, it's all about the kids' sports, that's another God. Why not be involved with what God is doing? You see, some of the advantages people have in other countries and I've spoken to people that have been in persecution where they could be arrested, and now they're in the United States. They say, you know, sometimes the greater temptation is to be here because we can get distracted with other things that don't matter. In the other country we were at, you either believe in God and you're persecuted or you, or you lie, and you don't. And so there is this thing. So God has called us to have an adventure with him. So how do you get to know God? And I think there's a third type of person. First people, they, they, they believe in God, but they don't know him. Other folks, they know him, but they don't know him well. And I believe most of us here today, and I pray this is your purpose, is to, is to get this group here, is to know God intimately and serve him wholeheartedly. To know God intimately and serve him wholeheartedly. And that's what we're going to spend the rest of our time today 
uh, in our, our remaining minutes today is how do we cultivate a life to know God? And I just wanted to encourage you because this last couple of weeks I've been a little sick. And as a result of that, I, my, I had headaches. I couldn't read. And my devotion life kind of skipped a little bit. You know, I listened to the Bible. But I wasn't doing the same amount of praying and reading. And you know what I felt? I felt like, ah, oh, I miss my time with God. I was still spending time with God, but I missed it. See, it wasn't like I felt condemned by God. Where are you? You're not reading your Bible. No, I missed my time with God, and I pray that when we say these things to you, we're not putting condemn, condemnation on you, like, you got to do this. No, it's like you're missing out on an opportunity to know the creator of the universe. You're missing out on an opportunity of becoming the person you've been designed to be. You see, it's an opportunity to fully be human divinely. God has a divine purpose for everyone here. And that only is, this, is realized by knowing God. Well, how do you know God? I just mentioned it. You know God by following him. We follow Christ. He became that pathway. You can't follow God because he's way out there. But he sent Jesus to show us the way that we can follow him. The Bible says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And the way we know God is through Jesus Christ and him alone. Jesus kept saying, come follow me. And the man said, let me first bury the dead. And this is what Jesus said in, in Luke 9.62. I'm, I'm kind of jumping ahead a little bit with some of the scriptures I'm paraphrasing for the guys in the back. Appreciate it. In Luke 9.62, Jesus said, anyone who puts his hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. You see, with God, I'm all in. God wants a people that's all in. You ever try to climb a fence and try to between two yards? I've tried to do that. It's not, very, it's not very happy. When you get caught between either go to the other side or the other, the Bible says, you know, some of you are hot and some of you are cold, and I can deal with that, but what I can't stand is a lukewarm. I will spew you out of your mouth. Why? God has not created us to be half-hearted followers. It does not work. We're created to go full tilt headfirst with Christ. My friends, this is the beautiful part of it is this. When you and I live our lives for Christ, you can truly become the person you've been designed to become. Isn't that wonderful? That you can live your life, and at the end, as you wrung out your life, you can say like the Apostle Paul, I have finished a faith. Grace, I have finished a faith. I've done what I've called to do. I don't know about you, but I really enjoy working hard and then relaxing afterwards. You know what I'm talking about? Well, you put in a hard day's work or hard week, and then it's the weekend. It's like, ah. Now I can relax because I've worked hard. I don't know about you, but when I'm going to enter heaven, I want to be exhausted and to be able to rest in his presence saying, I gave everything I possibly could. That's the way that we're supposed to live our life. We're supposed to live in an adventure. And all these other stuff that we do are mirages, they're distractions, they're facsimiles. It's chewing gum of purpose. How many of you want to chew a gum of purpose or actually make a difference? God wants us to know him by doing such. John 14, 5 to 6 says this. I read that to you. He says, how do we know who you are? I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. But you know what the Bible says? The Bible says in, in Mark 8, 34, gentlemen. Mark 8, 34. I'm talking to the guys in the back, ladies and gentlemen. Then calling the crowd forward, to join his disciples, he said, if any one of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways. Now listen, I don't know if you realize this, but when you're selfish, you know what selfishness does? When you're selfish, you feed on yourself. It's like a, it's like a disease that consumes itself. Like a flesh-eating disease. Do you realize when you're selfish, you eat off yourself? How are you supposed to be healthy if you are being a cannibal of yourself? 
You're not designed to get strength from yourself. You're designed to get strength and sustenance from God. Now, this is the weird thing, or not the weird thing. The, the, the thing that the Bible says, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. He's talking about the Holy Spirit that will be given later on. And so, yes, you find the strength of God within you. But going in without God, you're going to be, begin to cannibalize yourself, and you will not be strong. But when you have Christ in you, that rivers of living water, you begin to get the sustenance of something that's been installed of you called the Spirit of God. So you go in deep to find God who's implanted in your heart. So Jesus says, if anyone wants me to follow you, you must turn from your selfish ways. Listen, how many of you have ever been happy trying to be selfish? I didn't get my way. When do you get irritated? You get irritated when you're selfish, right? You get frustrated when you're selfish. They don't respect me. I feel it because I'm not being it. When it's all about you, it's a cannibalism. of It's going to rob you of joy. But when you do it for God, you don't worry about it anymore. You're not worrying about if someone likes you or not. You know, God loves me, and that's all that really matters. And I'm sorry, and I'll listen to you, and I'll learn from what you're saying. But my sustenance does not come from my selfishness. It comes from God. And then you have a solidarity that cannot be shaken. Listen, you want to be ready for the end times? This is the stuff that gets you ready for the end times. That when the times, when everything is pulled away from you, you have something that's stronger and greater than material things. And that's all part of it. I'm going to ask the worship team to make their way up, especially Esteban. You can make your way up, please. Thank you. Jesus says, come follow me. That's all part of the process. And we follow him. How do we follow Christ? We follow him by getting to know him. How do we get to know him? We get to know him by spending time with him. How do you get to spend time with God? My friends, I, I, I wish I could come up with something brand new. I wish I could come up with something cool. But it's so old school. But it's the only way to go. You get to know God by spending time with God. <laughs> Imagine that. And how do you spend time with God? Getting into the Word of God. I'm telling you, by reading the Word daily, getting to His Word daily is how you get to know God. And then when you find something, let me explain something. You don't read the Bible to know more about God. You read the Bible to know God. I don't spend time with Sandra and get interviews and we go on a date. I take out a pad. I ask her all these questions to find out about her. Well, tell me about your childhood. And I'm running this down like a psychologist. No, I want to get to know her heart. And so when you read the Bible, you say, God, I don't want to just know about you. I want to know you. And I ask you, if you ask God to open your heart and your mind, when you read the Bible, he'll begin to speak to you. He does every day. As I open the Word of God. And when you come together at the church, and we had our friend David Wagner, he's a part of the body, someone might say something to you that will confirm what God is calling you to do. And then when God tells you to need to forgive this person, and you listen to God, you do what He asks you to do, you know Him more. The Bible says, if you do what I do, I will reveal myself to you. It's not a matter of making God like you. He likes you because of Christ. But now, availing yourself of the opportunity to come to know him, you know him by listening to what he says and doing what he says and reaping the benefits, not because of legalism, but because of relationship. If I eat well and sleep well and exercise well, I'll be more healthy. And I won't be sick like I have been the last two weeks. Right? When you do the right things, you reap benefits. Why? You're designed to know God. And the purpose of Cornerstone Church is for you to know God, for me to know God, and to help you to be self-sustaining. It's my prayer and hope that you would be a people that come to me. Look what the Lord showed me this past week in my scripture. Not I got to hold on to Sunday. No, that you become self-sufficient. That we come here on Sunday to encourage each other, invite people into our family and say, wow, these people know God because God has a purpose and a plan. 
Oh God, you're my God, Psalm 63, 1. Oh God, you're my God, early I will seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there's no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power, your glory, because of your loving kindness is better than life. And the Bible says in Psalm 910, and those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. The Bible also promises in Jeremiah 29, 13, and if you will seek me, you will find me when you search with me with all your heart. Listen, you have been designed for God by God. Some of you know about God, but you don't know him. Some of you know God, but not very well. And some of you are saying, I want to know him more. I think all of us today are one of those categories. And I pray, my prayer for this church, if we're going to do anything worthwhile, we got to know God. That's just the way it is. And it is a never-ending journey and adventure that can never be exhausted. The greatest golf game, the greatest bike ride, the greatest run, the greatest concert, the greatest artwork you've ever seen pales in comparison to who God is. Those are shadows of God, not God. There's an adventure for you. It's in Christ Jesus. God's calling our church to know him and to make him known. That's our job. How can they know unless they are sent? My friends, you are sent in your workplace. Do not despise where you are. If you're a stay-at-home mom, don't despise that. If you're helping with the kids, God, don't despise it. Wherever God places you, be him where you are. And let him change your life. God's not called us to survive. He's called us to thrive in him. My friends, there's nothing greater than that. As you get to know him, you'll, your heart will break for the things that break him. Romans 10, 13 says this. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? My friends, where are the tellers? The only way you get your money you have to go to a teller, right, in the bank. You and I are the tellers. We bring the exchange of what God has given. He's placed us in that position. Let's all pray. Father, I want to thank you so much that you've made life extraordinarily simple. It's so simple, it's scandalous, Lord. It's so simple. You've called us to surrender our lives to you, to entrust our lives to you, you are our creator. You are our lover. You are our father. You've designed us. You know what's best for us individually and corporately. And Father, today we recognize that we want to know you more. We want to know you more, God. We realize when we know you more, we truly can be human. We can truly be what you divined us to be. And so, Father, I ask right now in Jesus' name that you begin to place a hunger in our hearts. And some of you today have absolutely no desire to go after God. Zero. But you know you should. Don't wait for your emotions to tell you what to do. You tell your emotions what to do. One of the things I want to encourage you to do, and I've learned this, especially in our traditions that believe in the fullness of God, we tend to put a lot of stock in our emotions. Our emotions are only, a, only something that God has given us. Don't let your emotions control you. You control your emotions by the will of God in your life. And you know what I'm saying is true today, but you don't feel it. Who cares? You make a decision to go after God. And what I'm going to do right now, I'm going to just pray a prayer. Maybe some of you know about God, but you don't know Him. You believe in Him, but that you don't know Him. You say, Pastor, to be honest with you, I, I do believe, but I don't really know who God is. And um, I believe, but I don't know Him, but I want to know Him. And if you were to die today, how would you know you would go to heaven? Well, I'm a pretty good person. I you know, I give. And no, it's not about that. It's about surrendering your life to Christ. That's the only way. You can go before God is you have to give your life to Christ. And maybe some of you haven't done that today. I don't know where you are. Maybe some watching uh, live or later on. Let's just go ahead and bow our heads. I'm going to pray a prayer. And um, 
I'm going to pray a prayer. Maybe you'd say, Pastor, I, I really want to, I want to give my life to Christ. I realize I haven't done it, and I want to do it. Just every head bowed. Can I just see a quick show of hands? You say, Pastor, please pray for me. I want to give my life to Christ. I haven't done it. I want to. I see a quick show of hands. Anyone this morning? I say, Pastor, that's me. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else this morning? I say, Pastor, I want to give my life to Christ. I, I know about it, but I want to give my life. I believe this is one more person I believe there is this morning. Anyone other person? If you acknowledge me before men, I'll acknowledge you before the Father. Okay. Let's go ahead and pray this prayer. If you pray this prayer from, the, from your heart, it will begin a new beginning. Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins, all the things I've done wrong. I willingly walk away from them. I ask you to forgive me. I pray you'd fill my life with your grace, with your power. And I give my life to you today. I declare that I'm no longer the boss, but you are. You're in control. I give my life to you. Now fill me with the power to stay strong in you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to continue to pray for some of you. And some of you are maybe say this morning, you know, I know about God, but I don't know him very well. Well, I have news for you today, folks. You can know him well. You don't have to have it all together. You don't have to look like me, smell like me, thank heavens. You just be the best you you can be. God has called you. So I want to pray for you right now. Father, in Jesus' name, many of us in this room, Lord, we come to church. We listen to Caleb. <laughs> Once in a while we read the Bible. But we really don't know who you are. God, we want to go deeper. Now, Lord, we, just, we, we recognize the fact that we have not gone deeper because we put everything else before you. This morning we recognize that. We want to put you first in our lives. We don't want you to be a second thought. We want you to be the first thought of what we do. Lord, I want to give my life to you afresh. I'm tired of being a casual, weak Christian. I want to be strong. And Lord, I don't know what I have. I don't have what it takes, but I thank you you do. I give my life to you afresh, asking for your strength today in Jesus' name. Maybe some of you would say, Pastor, I'm tired of going halfway. I'm going all the way. If that's you this morning, why don't you just stand right now, and you're, wherever you are. Say, I'm tired of going halfway. I want to go all the way with God. Come on. Let's stand up for something in our lives. I want to go all the way with God. Come on, let's stand up right now if you want to do that. I don't want to play anymore. Father, in Jesus' name, we want to go all the way, God. We want to be the team. We want to be the, the, the army, Lord, that takes the world by storm with the amazing, amazing power of your love that breaks down barriers that no political candidate can do, no military might can do. It's called the power of you, God, through love, through Jesus Christ. Father, I ask that you draw us all closer to you, that we be a church that knows you. When people walk in this church, they would sense your presence at a higher degree. When people drive by, they would sense there's something here. The Lord Jesus is in that place. Father, may we be known as a church of Jesus. That you are here. That you are honored. That you're the honored guest. That you're the resident. You're the guest and residence here. In Jesus' name. Lord, I ask for fire to burn in our hearts, God. That we make a decision not to wait for our emotions, but we make a decision because it's the right thing to do that we will align ourselves to receive from you and to grow in you, Father. We thank you. You desire everyone to know you and to live a life worth living. We thank you, Father God, that we can do that today in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask the, uh, the prayer team to make their way up. If you need prayer for anything at all, we believe in gathering two or three in my name and touching a matter. If you need healing for your body, situation at your house, situation with your family, whatever you're going through, we want to pray with you. And we're going to have one closing song as we do that. Listen, if, if you prayed that prayer today, there's a little card in your bulletin. If you want to come up and tell somebody, or you can fill in a little card. It says right here, I accepted Christ as my Savior for the first time. If you could fill that out. Put it in one of the boxes or hand it to one of the ushers or come forward and give it to one of the prayer team. We want to give you a special gift. We want to help you in your new life today. All right? So we're going to have a closing song as we do that. Uh, we're going to ask folks to come and need prayer. All right, ask them give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus.
God bless you. May his grace shine upon you, give you strength and power for this week coming. God bless you. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. And if you'd like to come to our class, we're going to have it at 1230. God bless you. If you need prayer, the altars are opened up. God bless you.